Aaron Ralston was a young adventurer who became trapped in a cave in remote Utah. While descending down a narrow slot canyon, he dis accidentally dislodged a 200 kilogram boulder, which pinned and crushed his hand to the wall, leaving him trapped and stuck. He budged, he pushed, he did everything he could to try and move the boulder, but to no avail. He tried to chip away at the boulder with his penknife, but did nothing more than blunt the penknife. As the days went on, as he ran out of food and then water, he realised that he was stuck and that no one knew where he was, no one was coming to find him, and the only option he had left was now to cut off his own arm, which he did. He tied a tourniquet around his arm using his free hand and his teeth, he then, and he then realised that there was no way he could cut through his own bones, so he broke both bones in his arm by push, pushing all his weight, leverage against the wall and the rock cracking through both bones and then using his penknife to hack through the skin, the muscle, the veins and the nerves of his arm. An extraordinary thing to do. And he then abseiled out and walked through to safety and rescue. I tell you this story not to put you off your breakfast, but to illustrate how strong is our human survival instinct. Most of us would do anything to stay alive, including perhaps, if we were pushed to it, cutting off our own arm. And when our human instinct is so strong to survive, we can see then how, how, how extraordinary it was that Jesus was able to work against that human part of himself to be willing to go to the cross. We hear Jesus speak of this today as he does three times in Matthew's Gospel, where he says that he's going to go to Jerusalem, to where the place where he knows his enemies are strongest. He knows that like Jeremiah, whom we hear in the first reading, that he's been captured by God and wants to do what God asks of him, which, like it did for so many of the prophets, Jesus knows will lead to his death. We hear Peter then speak up and say, no, heaven forbid this, Lord, this should not happen to you. And we don't know whether this is purely altruistic on Peter's part, out of his great love for Jesus, which we heard just a couple of weeks ago in the gospel, or whether it's actually a bit selfish and it's really part of Peter's own self-preservation kicking as well, and I think it probably was. Peter knew if Jerusalem was dangerous for Jesus, it would be dangerous for his followers like himself as well. And so Peter pushes back against Jesus. But Jesus comes out with this quite extraordinary rebuke. Get behind me, Satan, he says to Peter. And I wonder if he says that because he heard in Peter's words something of a temptation to himself. That yes, Satan would indeed love for, for Jesus not to go to the cross and not to do the thing which was obedient to God and would ultimately win all our salvation. To take the easy way out, to lean into his humanity and to survive and preserve himself. But Jesus instead then goes on to, to give some teaching around the nature of self-sacrifice. He says those who, want to, those who want to save their life and cling to it will lose it, meaning really losing it spiritually. But those who are willing to, to lose their life for my sake and the sake of the gospel, they will find life. They will be fully spiritually alive, those who are detached enough. And he goes on to say, what does it profit a person to gain their fortune or gain the whole world and lose their very soul, lose the thing which makes them most authentic? And so this is an extraordinary teaching of Jesus, which is very hard for us, modern Catholics or anyone, to hear and respond to. We don't want to lose our lives. We are like Peter and like Aaron Ralston and like everyone who want to survive. We want to live. Why would any of us be willing to give up our lives? Jesus shows us how. Jesus shows that it's got to be a, the only way we can ever overcome our own base survival instinct is to be on about something bigger than ourselves. Jesus had a mission from the Father. He had a purpose that allowed him to look beyond his own self-preservation. And I think we admire this whenever we see it in anyone. It's why we honour those who fall in war, because they were able to live for something bigger than and beyond themselves. Of course, we see that in so many people, uh, in even their parenting. Parents who give up everything for their children, who put their children and indeed their spouse first. This is self-sacrificial love. But it's an important teaching we need to take hold of, that we need to be people who are on about something more than ourselves, something bigger, than ourselves. The invitation to social justice within the church is just such a challenge, just such a call. To look for justice, not just for one person, not, we often speak of getting justice for someone, 
But social justice is, is creating a just society for all people. Social justice is not charity, it's not welfare. Indeed, the need for long-term charity and long-term welfare is an indication that the structures of our society are not completely just. They do not, on their own, allow all people to flourish and to live the kind of life that God invites them to, a life which is fully alive in every way. So social justice is really more of a challenge to how we actually might recreate a world and a culture and a society where the kingdom of God is embedded so much that everyone has a chance to live life to the full. This weekend is Social Justice Sunday, and every year the Australian bishops issue a statement on Social Justice Sunday, which is a challenge to all of us. It's a challenge not just to, to do one good thing. It's a challenge for us to see the world through, through the lens of the gospel in a way that impels us all to justice. This, week's, this year's go, uh, statement is this one, living life to live life to the full, put out by the Australian bishops, which is on mental health in Australia today. This is an incredibly timely and powerful statement because we know, as we, and in particular if we read this statement, how interconnected uh, mental illness is with so many other issues of poverty, of homelessness, of incarceration, of poor health outcomes, so many things which interlink and, a, and an understanding of, of mental illness and a way of supporting those who have mental illness is so key. So I want to read to you just one short paragraph which is indicative of the tone of this wonderful document. We want to say clearly that mental ill health is not a moral failure. It is not the lack of faith or of weak will. Jesus himself was labelled mad. And, like us, he suffered psychological distress. People experiencing mental ill health are not some other people. They are us. And that's why it's so important that we do read this statement. And you can get this either from our church or in the link below from the Justice website. But we recognise that, that there is a dignity to every human person that having mental illness does absolutely not take away from. Although in the past people with mental illnesses have been quite literally demonised, uh, especially by, by, by Christians. So we need to recognise there is a goodness and a dignity that we need to respect. Whether that person with mental ill health is a stranger on the street, someone in our family or even ourselves. Because one in four Australians experience mental ill health at some stage of their life. If that's you right now, you might want to read this encouraging, affirming document that speaks of your goodness and your dignity in Christ. And is a call to all of us in the church to support one another and all those who suffer and struggle.